very, very happy to have you here. It happens quite rarely to get such a great book that reads like a mystery novel. <laughs> so for those that don't know Camille Brothers, she specializes in Italian Renaissance and Mediterranean art and architecture. She's professor at uh, Northeastern University in Boston. And previously she was teaching at University of Virginia where she held the Valmarana chair and she was uh, director of the Venice program. She has been visiting professor at Harvard, at the GTA in Zurich and at TU Vienna. And she is also the author of uh, also an incredible book uh, titled uh, Michelangelo, Drawing and the Invention of Architecture. But uh, this evening we are here for Giuliano da Sangallo and the Ruins of Rome. It just came out and uh, so please, without further words, of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to, uh, great to have a conversation. Um, and so I, I'm really looking forward to your questions and so forth, but I wanted to just, um, Giuliano is not as well known as Michelangelo, so I wanted to establish a little bit my point of view about him and kind of the main sort of questions that I was thinking about in the book. Um, so I'm just starting with this portrait because I think it's, it's a quite rare portrait for this uh, time to, for a architect to be the subject of an important image like this. And it's also interesting as a double portrait by Piero di Cosimo because it's establishing lineage. So in a way, it's, it's kind of like a singular example of how Giuliano knows how to speak a humanist language. He knows and he's communicating his stature. And that's important for everything he does. It's important for the whole conception of um, the drawings and the drawings as a kind of precious book, um, which is uh, my main subject. Um, so also just before I talk about the main topic of my book, which is his drawings of Rome, it's important to just remember that he was a practicing architect and a very successful one for Lorenzo de' Medici. Um, and that was how I first became interested in him. I, I think I, my first uh, attraction to Giuliano was through Poggio Cagliano, which is just an extraordinary villa and kind of like it's I, the idea that it was so um, elevated architecturally and so um, ambitious in its kind of language and reference and yet here it was in the, in the countryside um, kind of seemed out of place in a sense and it, so I started thinking about how to just, what was Giuliano's range of references and his intellectual world. Um, and then other other of his buildings that really attracted me were things like um, Santo Spirito and the, the, his, the sacristy with these crazy capitals, like these capitals that are just really works of art in themselves and, and so strange and inventive and also different, like all of them were different. And having at that, I guess I got interested in Giuliano over a number of years, but it was a point in my architectural education where I'd done a lot of courses with um, Chiza Palladio and learned all about kind of correct um, vocabulary of classical architecture, and this is not it. And yeah. so <laughs> I was interested in Giuliano as this kind of like inventive, creative rule breaker, but then how in a Florentine scene, which was really, obs I, I wouldn't say they were obsessed with rules, but they were very interested in, in um, ancient Roman architecture, how he kind of found this language. And then another thing that struck me about him as an architect, and all of these informed the questions that I was asking about the drawings, was how he used triumphal, ancient Roman triumphal architecture um, in courtyards like at, um, like here at Palazzo Scala. That was something I'd learned. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's now a, it's now a Four Seasons Hotel, yes. in fact, <laughs> which is positive. That's good. It used to. It used to be a bank, and so now as a Four Seasons Hotel, as long as you're willing, willing, willing to pay for an overpriced aperitivo, you can, you can, you can go, go and enjoy the courtyard, exactly, and some nice music and so forth. <laughs> um, but so I'd learned about Florentine architecture, that the Florentines were very um, 
modest about showing, you know, showing too much ornament on their facades and they wanted to be restrained and traditional. And you go in, the, it's true on the facades, but then you go in here and it's just, it's a complete a, a, over the top Extravagant. explosion, exactly, extravagant explosion. Um, so that's a little background. Um, but then the, the main topic of the book is, is this very unusual um, book of drawings and its companion, or sort of its companion. So the main book of drawings is, it's huge. It's, um, you know, kind of like a, tor a human torso in, in length. And it's, you basically have to, it's a physical exercise. You have to stand over it and turn the pages. Um, it's on parchment, which is very expensive. Um, and, but that physicality and the size is important, and that was a crucial element to how I thought about it, because I think it's a book made for sh sharing. Um, for, you know, you would, I can picture Giuliano standing there, and there would be people around him, and he could point things out, either just, you know, kind of people, members in, of his workshop or other patrons, and, and show what he'd done. Um, the other book, which I'm just showing you there for scale, um, was the Tequino Sinese, so there's two versions of it, um, the, uh, it, the inside and the outside of it, um, so it's a smaller book, and that, it, it's interesting because it was also on parchment, but of course it's portable, so, so he could, it, that's a, you know, it's like the size of, of the mole skins that every yeah. architect um, at least has to show that they're an architect, <laughs> um, even if they don't use so much. Um, and so that I think he could have shown when he was, tra or brought with him when he was traveling and so on. Um, but then also just to point out, um, it, this is super unusual uh, as a book, not just in its size, not just in being on parchment, but for this frontispiece, which is the kind of thing that you find in illuminated books of drawings, but not in um, architect's sketchbooks. Um, and and it's, it shows how self-conscious he is. So he's saying, you know, this is his new name. He'd just recently gotten this last name, Sangalo. Um, e molti disegni e misurati tratti dallo antico, um, 1465. So, so he's he's declaring his project, and and this is part of what makes me think about the book as a kind of visual treatise. It's 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 having his it's a kind of statement of his architectural ideas and backgrounds and sources, um, with some words but not many words, uh, but very intentional, and that that's the kind of um, indication. Um, so the book itself is this um, real mix, heterogeneous mix. So there are some pages like these which are kind of collecting things and seem like collages almost, um, that they're like heterogeneous elements in which he's, and he's delighting in the heterogeneity. He, he's celebrating that they're different the sources. There, well, so I think they meant, to, I think it's fictive. I think he's, it's meant to appear a little bit like a, a mix and even a mess. And I think the sources were divergent because some, in some cases he probably copied from other architects. But I, but I think if you look at the arrangement of the page with the door, for example, it's symmetrical, right? And, it's, and there's kind of, he's playing with scale because he puts a little, a little um, teeny plan up there in the top and then he arranges the, um, the architraves on the, on the side. So he's, it's, it's deliberate and intentional, but also you know, a little bit playful and, and giving that idea of a hodgepodge or, or a bit of a mix. Um, some pages. And then there are pages like this, which are kind of like little paintings. Like they're, they're extremely uh, pictorial. They have all the, um, the kind of niceties of wash, uh, which is very unusual, even color. Um, this is a, I can't think of other, uh, I can't think of, any, there's a new book about um, color and architectural drawings by uh, Basil Baudet, which may, you may know or have, um, but uh, he's writing about much later drawings and it's very unusual in this period, um, but Giuliano does it. And he does these other kind of interesting things with all these fictive um, demonstrations of his skill as a kind of draftsman where he's showing not just um, this version of the um, of here the theater of Marcellus as if it's coming down so you can see I, I can use this yes. as a point of, so you can see that it's he's drawing it as, as a, if it's about to collapse you know it's still mm -hmm. there of course <laughs> so it, it didn't collapse but he was speaking in a kind of rhetorical way about the the 
fragility of ruins. Um, but then he's also always thinking as an architect, so he's like, okay, for the architects in the audience, um, here, here are the details that you can, that you can draw and you can copy, and I care about the profiles too. Um, and the other thing about these drawings is almost all of them have scales and measurements. So he is giving that information um, that architects at the time would, would want. And then he has a little, there's like a uh, libro degli archi is what scholars have sometimes called it. So he has this little book of um, triumphal arches uh, all collected together. There's a few little organizational um, parts. Um, the Tequino Senesi is quite different. It's more abstract, and there you have, this is an extraordinary drawing. Um, Howard Burns first recognized this as the first time that the orders had correctly been proportionately um, drawn. So what's interesting about this in terms of Giuliano is he's, he's collecting, he's bringing all these things together, but he's also thinking about, okay, what does this add up to? What, it, what does this mean? I'm taking advantage of the fact that there are so few. Yeah, 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 please. What had happened in terms of drawings and treatises before he was doing this? Yeah. I mean, what, there was Alberti? There was Alberti, but Alberti was unillustrated and in yeah. Latin. And so, and so what had, so there, there's a really interesting question, which is, um, so Giuliano had overlapped with Fra Giacondo mm -hmm. in Naples. They'd been there at the same time. Yeah. Two interesting architects, uh, ambitious, interesting architecture. Yeah, at the, at the, um, Filarete didn't overlap with them, but you're, oh, you're saying in terms of writers about architecture beforehand. Yeah, so yes, yes, things yes, in yes in exactly. Right, way. right. So Filarete is also there. Francesco de Giorgio mm -hmm. had also um, been writing. Um, what I was going to say just about to finish the thought about Fra Giacondo is it's possible that the two of them had conversations and met in Naples. It was hard to verify because there's no documentation of the meeting, but they were there at the same time. So there certainly would have been other kind of influences, but Fra Giacondo, for, or sorry, uh, Francesco de Giorgio, for example, who's quite parallel as a figure in many regards uh, because he's also looking at Rome, also drawing. Of course, he's writing a lot more and he's reading and translating Vitruvius. But through all that information, he never gets to this. He never gets this right. Um, he doesn't figure that out. So, um, so somehow, Giuliano is able to put these things together in a way that and some other architects are not. He was in Florence, certainly in terms of Alberti. So the crucial thing there is that um, Lorenzo de' Medici, you know, Giuliano and Lorenzo de' Medici were like this, and Lorenzo was so eager to read Alberti that reportedly, like, he was at the baths and had gout, and so he still he was having this read to him. And so Giuliano also, even though I don't think his Latin is very good uh, at all, he would, have, you know, obviously Lorenzo was fabulous in Latin, so he would have been able to understand Alberti. Um, and I think Alberti is, in fact, a more important kind of influence for Giuliano than, than um, Vitruvius or anyone else. Um, so he has this understanding of the orders. Um, the other part that he think does in the Tequino Senese is this kind of, so he's more theoretical, he's more abstract, and he's critical. So this is an interesting example of contemporary architectural criticism because he takes Brunelleschi and Santo Spirito plan. Here he reproduces it um, as it was in the um, Codex Barberini. In the Tequino Senese, he adds um, a bay. So he's, because this was the problem that everyone worried about, that there were four bays and so there was no central access. So this is essentially his correction. It's like, yes, I mean, he respected and loved Brunelleschi, obviously, because he's the only recent architect whose work he, he includes. But he's like, eh, you know, if it were I me, can do better. <laughs> it could have been better, exactly. There was some little ego. <laughs> of course, yes, of course. It's hard to have an architect without a little bit of ego. Um, so then the other thing that he does, which is very relevant uh, for his own buildings, but also that of many other architects at the time, is he makes this, he, he really um, makes a big effort to make these collections of important um, typologies. So here, the centralized building, um, and these were not well-known buildings. These were mostly tombs on the Via Appia, you know, it wouldn't have been easy to survey at them, and, but then he organizes them. And this page, I find really interesting because the work that he did there 
was copied by so many people. This was like an aspect of the project that I w it would have taken me another 10 years to write about kind of the impact and influence of Giuliano and others. But this drawing, I can tell you, there are many anonymous copies of, and it's obvious why, because architects were fascinated by centralized plans, and rather than have to go walk on the Via Appia, which is like annoying and long and like full of kind of mosquitoes and bandits and stuff like that, um, they could just get, get this. Um, and it wasn't just from there, it was from all sorts of sources. And what I'm showing you there is just one little example of a plan, unexecuted plan by Giuliano for San Giovanni de Fiorentini uh, that, that kind of you know takes up these themes so he's interested in um, certain so facade solutions so the other kind of interest question that interested me is like why is he interested in these particular drawings or types so something like the Basilica Amelia um, this is a solution of the, of the corner um, how do you end a building in a way that feels strong and so the Basilica Amelia which was destroyed in 1507 to build Palazzo Castellese has this circle double the du double corner with a circle and a square which is you know Sansovino uses this at, at, at the um, Biblioteca Marciana it's I mean it's once you kind of see that it's okay, everywhere it's, it's all over the place, right? It seemed, it's, it, once architects kind of cottoned onto the solution, it's everywhere. It resolved all sorts of problems. It resolved all sorts of problems. Um, and so it's, it's obvious why he was attracted to it, but, but that's a kind of like thinking like an architect that you see in these drawings. But then the thing that's led a lot of people to misunderstand Giuliano is the liberties he takes. So what I, what I think, so historians I think are not good at see, having a sense of humor or see, recognizing a sense of humor, uh, but Giuliano clearly had one. Um, and one example is this, um, the Porta Maggiore. So he, you know, the Porta Maggiore does not have a massive pediment, but he puts one on, but he doesn't lie about it. He just says this, from this, um, pediment or frontone uh, is from the tabernacles below. So he's just like, you know, it would have looked nice. It's like, it's a nice thing, but it would have looked better with a pediment. <laughs> so that's also thinking like an architect, but really improving things. Um, and these two are on the same page. And then this one also has here, he actually invents these nude figures. He kind of introduces this. Um, it, they're a little hard to see, but there's, a, there's this nude figure, and then there's a figure in a toga that are around this kind of crack um, under the arch. And then he puts um, the theater of, uh, or the um, mausoleum of Augustus in the background, this kind of uh, pile of, of ruins there. It's all a little bit um, he was never invented. A he was never? A painter, right? Officially. Uh, no, there's, uh, there are theories about the so-called ideal cities uh, that, that he could have been involved. I don't think there's enough evidence. I think they could have, there's some relationship. They yeah. are, they are. And he was friends with Botticelli and so forth. Um, but I don't see evidence that he actually painted anything on panel. I think he was, I, I think this is an extension. Yeah, I think this is an extension of his work as a draftsman, really. And anyway, this is just to remind you that the <laughs> actual Porta Maggiore did not have a betterment. Um, and then another example of something where he's, actually makes an interesting correction or adjustment to an ancient monument that is extremely influential is what he does with the markets of Trajan. So the markets of Trajan have this super odd system with the, um, their own pediments. Like these are just wild in a way, um, these half triangular pediments. And so he, he didn't like that or thought it was wrong. And so he corrects it here. And this motif is again, one that just everybody uses, you know, Raphael and ev every single neoclassical building around the world has these alternating pediments, but they didn't actually come from uh, the Marcus of Trajan. They came, I, I don't know that they came directly through Giuliano, but he's the first example that I know of that did that kind of um, adjustment of the ancient source. And then the other part, as I said, this, I, this wasn't an emphasis of the book, but I did talk about how he established, cert, he kind of marked certain monuments as potentially canonical, and, and then they were copied and became canonical. So one example is this building that you see if you take a train into Rome um, from, from Florence, which is the Temple of Minerva Medica, um, and he draws it here, and then it seems to be copied by Bernardo 
Stella Volpaia in CCA, the Roman sculpture, which you may know well, uh, Mariana. And then, and then it even makes its way to Palladio. And I'm not saying this is the exact route, but somehow he draws it and, it, and it's copied and circulated. And then I was also interested in just kind of how these drawings, you know, fueled his architecture. And so this is an example of where he's drawing all these triumphal arches, but it's a kind of flexible model. It's a model that can be used in a pretty literal way with all the relief sculpture, but it can also be seen in a more abstract way, just as the system of the arches and the pilasters. And then this is an interesting case where he, so this is what remains of this building, the so-called Cryptobaldi. It's actually not at all clear what it's really called. And I think he invented this second level. I think he, it was a design for the second level that he just inserted in an ancient monument as a way of kind of make your own source. Um, and I don't know that he lied about it. Maybe he was just kind of um, being clever. Uh, but then it appears, so there's something a little bit similar. Maybe he transferred it from the Marcus of Trajan here, but it appears in Palazzo Colchi. And so it's a kind of, maybe it was a way of talking to the patrons about like, here's some interesting way that I, uh, that I, you could do something. And then another kind of idea that you see him taking from antiquity, um, like this particular, is a kind of abstract manipulation of the wall and wall compositions. And that's something I find really fascinating just in, Cinquecento ar architecture and not that much described mm -hmm. um, because it's not the columns like it's a it's it's some kind of system of organizing the wall but it's not it's not columnar um, but you see it in a lot of his work uh, and then the uh, I was also interested just in his modes of representation like how he solves problems that I feel like are still not fully solved by architects about how to show the inside and the outside and doing it through these kind of either the neat way through the kind of pie slice or the messy way through the kind of <laughs> punch or bomb or something, some, some other way of getting inside fictively. These, that's not what these buildings look like. And then uh, because we're in Milan, I just wanted to also mention that uh, I think that I have a feeling and it's, I tried to suggest it, I think it's hard to prove, but that Bramante and, Mil and Giuliana were not necessarily the deadly enemies and rivals that they've been made out to be, particularly by Vasari. Um, and I think that there was a sharing of ideas around St. Peter's in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the drawing that everybody disputes. Um, it's just the watermarked version from the Uffizi, but so this is Giuliano's drawing and on the back are, are Bramante's sketches and everybody says, oh, Bramante was like criticizing or, or, or um, there was a kind of, you know, uh, Bramante was criticizing Giuliano or whatever, but I can imagine it as a, just a conversation that he was like, you know, maybe this should be done or that should be done. And then I also thought that there could be a way in which um, that Giuliano's collection of these small round buildings was relevant for uh, the Tempietto, um, which who knows if anyone will agree with me on that, but, um, but I wanted to kind of suggest it. Um, yeah. Because you have to use these clearly yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it work the chronologically? The Tempietto was designed in what was the 15th century or something. The Tempietto? Yes. Well, so that it's... But so then it must have taken ages to build it. So the Tempietto is it's traditionally before. dated 04, exactly. I was going to say 03 or 04. But there are recent theories that date it more like 1512. And that difference would be pro significant for Giuliano. And then it, it, and then it took years to build. And then it took a while to build. to build. Yeah, although I don't, I think it was built, since it's so small, I think it was built pretty efficiently. Yeah. Um, so it, that is, of course, the, so whether you prefer the early date or the later date for the Tempietto does matter in terms of whether my ideas are plausible um, on this particular front. And, you know, like, I could be wrong, um, but the point that I'm trying to make is essentially that there was this, that Giuliano was bringing this antiquarian culture, bringing the knowledge of these ancient buildings, and that was to the kind of putting it in circulation in Rome, and architects like like Bramante, who, who probably also drew antiquities, but we don't have any drawings that survive, um, undoubtedly benefited is the kind of broad point I'm trying to make. And then that kind of collection, I think you can see it going all the way to, to um, Michelangelo. So anyway, I just wanted to, to give some kind of visual introduction to the, to the project. Yeah.
uh, I found quite interesting for today's purposes your decision to illustrate uh, these books of images mm. and to say that you know you can read the image in the same way you read a text mm -hmm. but there is a difference right and you point out that uh, Alberti said that the reader will envision oh, right. yeah, the yeah. writing right will envision something that is different in every reader right uh, and instead in in Giuliano mm -hmm. you read the image and you get a, a direct reference, but at the same time he's pointing out in his drawing that, of course, you have the fragment of Rome, mm -hmm. and then you can enhance the drawing to build something right. new. Yeah. So that I found extremely relevant for today, mm -hmm. because we are used to copying the images or to you know, have a series of images that we put aside on our Instagram, on, on mm. all our devices, and that becomes such a strong reference when we are designing. Mm -hmm. But if we look at Giuliano, then you see how we can escape that right. reference and right. build something new, which right. is extremely difficult today. Yes. I want to say so you raised something important in terms of how I thought about this project. So I spent my entire career teaching architects um, and being in this kind of odd position in an architecture school, which is really quite peripheral. You know, being an architectural historian in architecture school, you're not the important person. You're, <laughs> it's, it's obvious, you, you know, you're, and I, a word that would be tossed around more when I was at the University of Virginia was, well, these are service courses, like the history courses are kind of like serving to teach, and you know, like, of course, nobody wants, who's an academic wants to think of themselves in the service industry, <laughs> but, but it was an interesting conception. And so, and the other thing that came, that kind of was part of my professional experience, or is probably a little less where I'm teaching now, but certainly at Virginia, was that, well, um, the history courses, courses serve to give precedence to the students. The students need precedence. And I found that such That's a... a very sort of, sort of opportunistic way of interpreting of course, it's like a little, it, it like hurts your feelings. <laughs> it's, yeah. sort of, it's like, that's how you think of me? That's all I can do for you? But, but, the, but what interested me was just that, that notion of precedence. It's such a dead idea. In, in a, I don't mean it's traditional dead. I mean, it's like static. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there's a thing and it exists and you can either cite it, you should know about it so that if, you know, some... Yeah, it, well, of course, of course. Nobody needs to know the, the, I mean, nobody's especially, that's why I'm like, I'm at two levels of kind of secondary in an architecture school because I, I'm also not teaching modernism. So, so at least the, at least architecture students know that if somebody refers to, you know, some Corbusier building, some obscure Corbusier building, they ought to know it. But the point that I was trying to make was that the relationship of an architect to the past does not need to be a static one. It should yeah. be a dynamic and creative one. Yeah. And that's what I felt had been misinterpreted in Giuliano yeah. and that I wanted to recover, is that he saw the past, he saw himself as in dialogue mm -hmm. with the past. Almost like, I mean, a way to picture it or is maybe, and I don't think I made this reference in the book, but is, you know, Petrarch apparently had yeah. these dialogues, these invented dialogues. Right. I mean, he sounds like a crazy person, but he had these dialogues with, you know, ancient Roman authors. He yeah. just imagined them. And, and I feel like Giuliano was kind of having a graphic dialogue mm -hmm. with past architects, or with architects of ancient Rome. And that's something I feel like any practicing architect could just, would just, it's just a much richer way of seeing your visual environment if you see that it doesn't have to be something that you either copy or a little bit that you take or, I mean, not even the postmodern kind of notion of like taking fragments, but yeah. actually thinking about yourself as an architect in rapport with some past um, series of choices and so that you can kind of like engage dynamically yeah. with them. Yeah. The other thing that, you, that your question brought up that I wanted to make, the point that I wanted to make is that this is more, so the first part of what I said is like kind of comes out of my experience teaching architecture yeah. or teaching architecture students um, history. The second part I think is just a kind of reaction against my field, which it's very text-centered. Right. And to me, I, that's not why I got into art history. I got into art history for the, for the amazing objects mm -hmm. and um, you know, works of art and architecture. 
and but there's a kind of tendency for kind of the tendency for historians to feel like if there's if someone doesn't say that this is like if if Alberti doesn't write or or Serlio doesn't write that something is true then then we can't know what they were thinking mm -hmm. and I'm trying to say this is a lot of visual yeah. evidence and we need to find yes, a key. Sometimes it's given what you just said. If these two manuscripts by Sangano had you know Back. been lost. Uh -huh. Like most things that we lost over Yeah, time. yeah, like Bramante's drawings yes. of Rome or whatever. Would you, lost? you as an individual, yeah. been able to imagine that behind his 20 or so buildings, I don't know how many mm -hmm. buildings are recorded by Antonio Sangallo, but Giuliano. Yeah, yeah. uh, would you have imagined that there was all this uh, you know, research behind his Designs. No. Because I'm, I'm just thinking of how much uh, in, imagination can be useful also to carry out uh, your profession as a historian. That mm -hmm. Making history, you know, is, uh, of course, you have the documents and uh, we are all lucky and happy to have these two mm -hmm. uh, quaderni. Uh, but, uh, you know, it would have been fantastic to, you know, would your interpretation of Sangallo's work would it have would it have been different probably? I so it's an that's an interesting hypothetical. I don't think I could have possibly imagined these books uh, if they mm -hmm. didn't exist or that they were behind the buildings because I mean I showed a few examples of how I think they had an impact on his architecture, but there's a huge amount that's in the books that is not in his architecture. And you could say that's because of the kind of conservative Florentine environment. They wanted to insist on being Florentine and not Roman, and he had all this Roman material, so because he, he, he couldn't use a lot of it. Well, Even when I he mean, worked on St. Peter's, he was wearing a Florentine yeah. dress. <laughs> 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 well, who knows? I mean, you can't escape your uh, origin. I'm just trying even to today. imagine what the relationship was between these two times. I mean, yeah. that's something which usually historians, they don't go into things which they can't demonstrate. Right. Then there must have been some kind of uh, uh, I identity element. Yeah, certainly about San Giovanni Fiorentino, uh, you know, for all of those um, those designs demonstrating the the um, connection to Florence. But I mean, I think it's more. I would put it more in terms of the his patronage circumstance. He didn't get as many commissions in the second part of his life when he was in Rome. So the patronage circumstances of Florence and mm. when when he was doing like Palazzo Gondi, he mm. couldn't put columns on it. Nobody wanted, you know, there was no way that a Florentine patron like Gondi who was quite conservative and trying to keep up with the Medici wanted to put massive being columns. Um, or, or in this case, Michelotto me meant making reference. I mean, Palazzo Gondi is essentially a, a homage to Palazzo Medici, um, and so it, it means it, it, it. Being conservative in this context means referring to the tradition, the local Florentine tradition. At some point in the book, you talk about the fact that the drawings of Giuliano are so difficult to make. Mm. And so it was difficult for others to copy his way of representing. Oh, right. And that's why then this idea of more canonized drawings come up and establish, and this idea of single point perspective uh, establishes, mm -hmm. because it's much easier to, to execute and everybody even not so skilled could do it. Right. Yeah, so I was thinking especially on these kind of drawings. So as I said, you know, I feel like they solve a problem that, that is an interesting one that is difficult. It's like, okay, architects, it's volumetric, it's spatial. You have the experience of, you know, I saw this, never been in here before. I saw it from the outside. Is this the right thing? What do I expect inside? And this is a, tra a building with glass walls, right? Yes. So it seems like I can. But if there was a representation of this, how do you convey all of those things? And of course, architects do it in multiple drawings, right? Yeah. Plan section and elevation. Um, but Giuliano comes up with this way of at least collapsing the, the elevation and the section into yeah. a single drawing. So, so initially when I thought, saw that and kind of recognized it, it just seemed like, you know, he, he did it. He figures it out. Why didn't everyone else do that? Um, and, and of course, 
there are a couple things. So one is that this way that he's he's using it to show round buildings means that um, it's not measurable in the same way that a, that a section is. Yeah. So it, so it doesn't have the same kind of precision in that regard. But I think mainly it's actually quite hard to achieve because it, these drawings are readable in part because of his use of wash. So I think that there was a kind of technical skill involved that when there, I showed some of the copies from these drawings in the book that, that just other draftsmen didn't always have. And so, so that was my, my theory was just that it was the plan section and elevation, you know, we, they're taught to first year students, like they're relatively, I mean, conceptually the section is weird and complicated, but it's, there, it's, it's kind of more easy to, it's easier to describe yeah. and, and um, reproduce, and it seemed, and, me, and also measure. And yeah, exactly. And now they, now, now there's lots of help, exactly. But at the same time, these drawings, are so much more compelling than the ones printed. You make a point that when he was drawing, the print was already invented, but he decides right. not to print, but to still make a manuscript. Right. And make it on parchment and not on paper. And so there was also an idea of building a rich object that mm -hmm. could somehow convince his clients or his public and because he was such a good draftman, he was able to, to build something that was extremely compelling. Right, I, I would think about it maybe like, I mean, you know now architecture offices sometimes pay other, other specialized firms to do their renderings, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And it's why, because the renderings are seductive, they're beautiful, and, and that's a way, or you know, to make a beautiful model. Why do, why do architects, you know, they know what they're doing, they don't necessarily need a fancy model, they can probably figure out what they're doing just from a little cardboard, ugly little cardboard model yeah. that they throw away. And yet every time you see a, a project that's prepared for a competition, it's this like, gorgeous model, or like if you think about even, you know, an office like OMA or something like that, they had those incredible resin models, and like who knows how many projects they got because yeah. of their gorgeous resin models. And so there, there's a way in which the singular, well-made, seductive object can be very um, compelling to, to a patron, and, and as, as I said, because this was a big book that you would physically stand around and could be described, I think it functioned in that way. You know, we, all historians have to fight against kind of anachronistic tendencies. And mm -hmm. so one of the anachronisms I think that historians have sometimes had looking at these books is just saying, well, if he had such important ideas, like why didn't he publish them? Like, and, and because obviously, like if, if you know, I can, I can fill as many notebooks as you like with my, <laughs> with my little scribbles and scrawls and thoughts, yeah. but it, that it has no kind of validity in the world unless you, unless you publish it. Um, but, I, but this was still a world in which um, there, you know, the, the kind of patronage circles were pretty small, like, you know, he was dealing with the Medici and the circle of the Medici and then the Pope and the circle of the Pope. And, you know, so there weren't that many people and then that the he... Medici became the Pope. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> perfect. Um, and so there weren't that many people that he kind of needed to share his ideas with. And, and then I, I think also if you picture these as, as translated into woodcuts, which was the available yeah. technology of, of making images during his time, there would have been a real kind of loss of, of their qualities. Yeah, yeah. By, the, you know, by the time you get to Palladio and engravings, there's, uh, there's um, yeah. you can so do more. Presumably, I would imagine that the, the, four, the four books of architecture by Palladio, Palladio was obviously a very capable draftsman. He must have done something rather similar to these. So and then he gave them yeah, to engraver, I right, right. Palladio's drawings are beautiful. Uh, he was not very good at drawing figures. Uh, they're kind of uh, embarrassing is a strong word, but <laughs> but but they're not they're not as accomplished. And and he was uh, he did a kind of a flat. He was less of a painter, I would say. Giuliano has this painterly yeah, yeah, aspect, yeah, yeah. and he did, you know Palladio's drawings are, are as I said they're beautiful drawings, but they're it's kind of flat wash. They're a little, yeah. They're just, um, they have, and they're less, you know, they don't have invented backgrounds or this kind of thing. It was a, 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 just a different approach. Well, the, the, I find it also interesting to, to, 
Shihan's interpretation of archaeology was evolved in that because there was, yeah. of course, the Alberti and the Magnetsky, which was maybe more elemental, and maybe it was more, you know, the column of. But, and then it was evolving into something else. Uh, of course, Michelangelo, I don't know how much Michelangelo was really interested in archaeology. There were science going around and measuring. Yeah, well, I mean, just but to... It, just was, to it, it was becoming more systemic and more complex over the decades. How right. You... So a few things. So first of all, archaeology as a field did not exist. So, so there was nothing, you know, the mo there was nothing really akin to the... The closest thing, what we'd call the kind of akin to archaeology in this period is what historians call antiquarianism, which is similar, you know, and they did do some things, like they did, they would dig around buildings a little bit to kind of um, be able to see, especially to see the bases, because they were interested in the in measuring the bases, so they did do a little bit of digging, which was like archaeology. The reason I resist that term is because it implies, or, you know, now archaeology is so scientific yeah. and, and so, like and so yeah, <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost. But in terms of the kind of changes over time that you were asking about, it's so people typically say that Donatello and Brunelleschi were the first to go to Rome and measure the ruins. I do not believe this. I don't believe they, I don't, I don't know, maybe Donatello went to Rome, maybe Brunelleschi did. I don't think Brunelleschi need to, needed to have go, gone to Rome. There's no evidence of this trip except for Manetti saying much decades later that it happened. It's really often repeated. It's one of these things that's often repeated all the time. Um, but the, no drawings survive, like whatever. Anyway, so I'm not sure that that happened at all. I think it was probably a retrospective thing that was made up. The really kind of like sea change in terms of architectural culture um, was architects Figure, feeling like they needed to draw Rome, like they needed that. So Bramante got his first job by making drawings of Rome and showing them to um, the Cardinal Caraffa. Mm -hmm. And Cardinal Caraffa was like, "Oh, why don't you build me a courtyard? You know, these are fabulous." So, so it became a kind of calling card of architects in the way that a portfolio mm -hmm. um, is for for architecture students uh, trying to get their first um, their first job. You know, it's a way of showing I'm educated. There was there was no degree you to show. I know what I'm doing. Do I intelligent. and I can and you know everybody wanted all antica things and so it it became that. The other thing that changes, although I don't think it changes. So Mario Carpo feels like what changed enormously again was when um, the first printed illustrations of books came out. I don't quite agree with that because I feel like there was still. It, so he says once the once um, Sara Leo prints images of of these architectural antiquities and everything else, then architects can just go to the prints. Yes. Um, but they actually continue to draw and they continue to criticize printed books and kind of draw on top of printed books. So I see it as more of a kind of continuing dialogue. Also, I find very interesting that he uses fragments as a starting point for his design. The same way somehow as people, as other would take the spolia and start from there to build their architecture. Right, right. And a, an interesting point that you make in the book is that afterwards the idea of ruin was somehow encoded into the law. And so it became something to protect and not right. something to take from. Right. So not something to use as, a, as an element on your yeah. design. Yeah, the idea of the spolia as a building block or the or the drawing as a building block is interesting. And there were some, I mean, there were, Peruzzi is a kind of um, interesting parallel or contrast who actually was building within the ruins um, in several circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of doing, and he was making draw, inventive drawings. So he was, in a sense, doing um, both of those things. Uh, but yeah, that point that I wanted to make at the end of the book that um, you're referring to is basically about how these ruins became an aesthetic object, mm -hmm. that they, they were not. Before, they were just these kind of bits and pieces around Rome, and yeah, you could use them as a... I, I remember when I was, at some point in my research, I was looking at these um, Storia degli Scavi of Lanciani, these books that I remember when I was first working on this, of, um, 
a mentor said to me, you know, you know you're going to have to go to bed with a Storia delle Scavi by your side. And I was like, that <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> because to me this was very, these were, was very compelling reading because I remember reading that for the Cancelleria that Raphael Diario, who's this well-known antiquarian, was, was, was like taking off pieces of the Colosseum to build his palace. It's just shocking to, from our sensibilities yes. because, you know, how, like, okay, if you're going to tear down an important building, well, that, that's a brutal act, but that the same person who's, you know, cultivating these little circles of, of, about, about ancient Roman theater and building this beautiful palace is also taking apart the Colosseum. So, so they, were, they were seen as kind of quarries, um, but, and they aren't anymore. And so, so that transformation really interested me. And, it, and I, th I think this aestheticization of the, of the actual fragments was just a, an important kind of piece in that direction. Um, but actually, things have changed. Now it's the opposite, you know? We have this respect for the ruin, for the fragments. And the shift the ruin. Yes, that's true. And that's healthy. true. I find it a bit unhealthy. It's extreme, you think. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you make this beautiful comparison at the end of the book between Petrarch and Giuliano da Sangallo. And you say, you know, Petrarch had Laura, uh, but we don't care about Laura. <laughs> we care about what Petrarch said of Laura. Right. Like, I feel like, you know, we shouldn't care so much about the ruins, but what we can do with them. Right. Well, it's a, it, no, it's interesting. It's a really, it's a tricky balance that I feel like is still very much in play. And, mm -hmm. and it's a fascinating for me. Um, I think for that reason, I remember speaking with an um, architect friend in New York, and she was talking about, well, to do this project, they were going to have to take, a, take down this historically listed building. And I was like, wait, if it's historically listed, how can you take it down? And she's like, oh, we're documenting it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, you're documenting it. And, but that was essentially, you know, the other, which I didn't have time to talk about today, but I talk about in the book, the other way of thinking about what Giuliano's doing is he's seeing Rome kind of dis be ta taken down, be dismantled and so forth, and he's upset about it. Yeah. And so he's documenting it be kind of before it disappears. And that's in fact how the book, his drawings have mostly been used by archaeologists yeah. as kind of evidence. Um, but then your, your point about, or you know, let's not be fetishistic about the, about the ruins or the... Or, of course, or, we, no, we like our ruins. Well, well, no, 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 but I mean, you know, if you think about um, this, this project, the other way that this project was um, kind of born or the basis of the project is also just kind of how much I love the city of Rome and yeah. thinking about what, what's so special about the city of Rome and what it's like to experience it. And of course, it's, it's destruction and creation, destruction yeah. and creation, destruction and creation, like it's a push-pull. It's not, I mean, yeah. it's not all preserved in crystal or yeah. some, or, and, and I think cities that are feel dead, you know? Um, but I do think that it has to be a kind of uh, balance dialogue. between, it has to be a dialogue because you have, you, you have to continue to live and change yeah. things and, and you can't just live within the kind of, ruins of the house that you inherited. Like yeah. you have to continue to kind yeah. of modify and change yeah, it. Yeah, for me, from a contemporary point of view, I have the feeling that today's architecture students in Italy take for granted what is there and don't even see it. Mm. And so they don't see it as a source of mm -hmm. interesting elements, not just aesthetically. Sometimes you look at these ruins and there's spatial ideas that have nothing to do with style right. or with the columns. Right, right. You know, they just An are idea. interesting yeah. architectures. Yeah, yeah. But the students don't really see them because that's the past and mm. we don't take from the past. We don't right. steal anything from there. Right, right. Yes, right. So that, that I think is kind of the most harmful idea to come out of the modernists. Yeah was this idea that, that you have to break, break from the past. There's one when I'm teaching, I also teach a kind of survey course on architecture, and when I'm teaching that, I, um, there's one Corbusier quote, which I show, out, so you know, he made all these drawings of like, of, he went all over the place, Siena and, and Greece and Rome and everywhere, and 
and so he obviously loved these things, but then there's this one thing that he says about, you know, Italy is like a graveyard of, yeah. or something like that. And it's like, oh no, like he makes his turn and condemns it all. And, and it's, we've never, we haven't recovered. Like architecture has not recovered from that kind of renunciation of the past and insistence that it's all has to be new ideas based on nothing and based yeah. on pure invention. It's, I think it's so false. And it's just, I just don't think that's how creative work happens. I don't, th I think it's a complete fiction. A and, and it's done a lot of harm. Um, and the, the, so the kind of idea which is so common for, for writers, for poets, for musicians, for artists, for architects in the Renaissance is that everything creative happens in terms of copying. It's all about a kind of the difference between an, you know, imitation or emulation or variation or whatever, mm -hmm. that it's all that dialogue. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard to kind of, the, the force of modernism has, yeah. is so overwhelming and, and present yeah. in current But that's why I, I really think these kind of books are important because you really, in your text, you really talk about Giuliano Sangallo, but make the reader think about how we could use the past today. Oh, good, good. In a positive way. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I'm happy for this conversation, partly for many reasons. Your questions are wonderful, but also it's challenging as a historian of the Renaissance to reach a contemporary architecture student or architect's audience that yeah. because it doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm not writing about, you know, you know, I'm not, I'm not writing about contemporary architects, and and I think it's some architecture students, if they've had certain experience or travel or whatever, have an interest in this kind of period and so forth. But otherwise, it seems like yes. itself the antiquarianism. I think would uh, would tend to believe that history uh, is something which goes against the present. Right. Right, so and and so they're to yeah. be interested in history. They see themselves, and I think many professors would agree with this uh, idea and even that they have to be fully immersed in the problems of the present, mm -hmm. and that even uh, you used the word before. What was it? Precedents. Uh, the same word. When they oh, precedents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Precedents are distractions mm -hmm. which have very little to do with the with the problems of today. Right. And this I think is a sort of it, it, this is in general an approach which is uh, anti against the idea that architecture belongs to a culture. Mm. Because even if you told the students that they should, you know, to understand Paris today, they should read a book by Zola or by Bazin, mm -hmm. they would even see that as being right. totally useless and counter. Right, so right. this is accompanied by a general kind of, do you say myopy? Right, you right, right, myopic, short, yeah, short yeah, sight right, short-sightedness, yeah, yeah. Kind yeah. of that professor. Well, you have recently been invited to the GPA and to TU in Vienna, in Vienna. Yeah. and they, since a few years, they have been establishing courses uh, on this period. Yeah. So it's counter to everything else. Right, right. You mean they, they're doing historical courses. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, why do you think is that? That's a great question. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, so the, to speak about the, I'm still collaborating now with um, uh, Pierpaolo Tamborelli, who's yeah. Milan-based, yeah. um, in, in Vienna. And, um, but he's uh, not a scholar. He, no, he's an architect, and but but it's interesting, and I think he, I think his, I mean, I think it's a very positive thing that he's kind of he's mm. he's a, someone who's saying this material is relevant, yeah. and essentially that's what is needed yes. to kind of like you need like I I can say it's relevant all the time, but architecture students, you know, don't especially care because I'm a historian. Um, but if architects start kind of making the connections, yeah. and so his point, and so I can speak about that more precisely because I've just been there, um, is that, that what the Renaissance has to teach contemporary architects is about 
um, engagement in kind of public life and the public yeah. the, the presence of the prominence of art in a public sphere and a kind of civic sphere and that's why it's interested in architecture and painting and so forth and, and the students were like surprisingly open to um, things and I'm I'm doing these a series of conversations with them um, in person and now over Zoom and they seem yeah very receptive. open very receptive. receptive very receptive and I, I also at, at at GTA found the students um, there I was teaching actually Mediterranean architecture and as I, the Islamic piece they'd never been exposed to yeah. that was completely new to them and they were very interested um, so I'm I'm a little more optimistic I think than you are in terms of in terms of student I think students potentially if you present it in a way that is that engages with their interests I think they they can be quite receptive to it um, and and can you know discover that there are possibilities there? Um, well, even from a research point of view, you know, it's kind of harder to do research on these topics because the source material is in a precise location, and you have to access it and you know go to Rome and go to the Vatican Library. And mm -hmm. uh, one question I had is like, how she managed to get copyright? of all these wonderful books. Oh. She, like, it's so expensive to produce a book. Yes. Like this one. I yes. mean, this is today the equivalent of Giuliano's <laughs> Codex Barberini. Right. Because actually... <laughs> At a fraction of the price. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, it's, you know, it's a well-printed book and it's yeah. very well illustrated. And I know that you have to pay for each image. Right. And so it's a project in itself that takes yeah. many years. Not just the research, and right, the text, right, the production. the production. Yeah. So I've been. So no, it's important and interesting that you bring up that aspect of the production of the books. So I was very lucky with both books. First of all, to w work with editors and publishers who understood that I make visual arguments. Yeah. I I can't. There are many books that can survive on the text alone. Mine cannot. Yeah. Mine are you. You have to. You really have to see what I'm talking about, yeah. or you do not understand it's, it. It's, it's incomprehensible. Or it's incomprehensible. And um, so, I mean, of course, I also, you know, cared a lot about, you know, the selection of photographs and the, and did a lot of work in photographic archives, which I really enjoy and love working in them. So that was true for both books. And then for, with both books, I was very l lucky to work um, with Jillian Malpass first at Yale, and then she was the d designer on the second book of Giuliano. And she's a wonderful um, editor and graphic designer who reads the text, and so she kind of understands the importance of text image. Um, but then with the Giuliano book, it was also a whole elaborate um, conversation and um, negotiation with the Vatican Library to, um, to be able to reproduce the photographs as many as I did from the, from the codex and, uh, and at a price that um, didn't put me in bankruptcy. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it, it, it's certainly a complicated aspect of, of producing an art, art, yeah. uh, a book in art or architecture. Um, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Are any of these two books digitized and accessible to anybody? So, the Giuliano books? Oh, yes. So they actually are digitized. Um, okay. Yeah, and I should, I should in fact put the links on my own website because and for people who are interested in looking at it's, the originals. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so because they're kind of not super... It's not super easy to find the, the digitized version. So they're not the on archive.org. Um, so... I think the Tequino Senese is, okay. and the Vatican Codex is on the Vatican Library website. Okay. Um, but the Tequino Senese, I'm pr it's, it's digitized somewhere, and I'm pretty sure it's archive.org. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so you can find yeah. the original. Because I find, you know, quite fascinating that most people don't know that these things are available. Yeah, well, I mean, they... It's a quite recent and positive development yes, that, that yes. they are. Yeah, okay, exactly. Because it's great to have your book, but it's also interesting if you're interested in the book and if you have yeah. read it to see what you have not put Oh, in absolutely, the book. absolutely. <laughs> see, oh, well, why didn't she include this one? Absolutely, yes. no, it gives you a whole other way of engaging. Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely.
Okay, thank, thank you so you. much thank for the conversation.